Hello everyone, my name is Isil Hashimi and I want to welcome you in this webinar. Today's webinar is the first session of Reservoir Characterization presented by Dr. Mustafa Orabi. Uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, Orabi has 25 years experience in petroleum industry. He holds a PhD degree, degree from North Carolina State University, the United States, and a master and bachelor degrees from Alexandria University. Dr. Orabi also joined Alexandria University in his early career as an assistant lecturer. Till he obtained his master degree, he also used to teach at community at community colleges in the United States. In the industry, Dr. Orabi held many positions in all aspects of petroleum industry and lived in many countries around the globe. Uh, so Dr. Orabi will present each Saturday live on the 3rd, 10th, 17th, 24th, and uh, the uh, 31 of October at 6 p.m. Egypt time. And there is a quizzes after each webinar, and the final exam at the end of the course. Certificate will provide it as well. Uh, I want to mention to do these quizzes and the exam, please follow Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook page. You can find a post <laughs> that contains uh, all the information for the Google Classroom and the password. Please join this classroom. Uh, and, um, and please just join one uh, classroom. Don't join the others uh, because they will not count it. Uh, also, for the next opener, use the same Zoom link to join us. So please, Dr. Mustafa, you can start now. Thank you, Rousseau. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, or wherever you are. Uh, as Rosa just mentioned, it's going to be a series of uh, webinars uh, regarding the reservoir characterization, plastics, and carbonate subject. So, without any uh, more taking of your time, let me start. Okay, just one second here. Okay. So, actually, before we start anything, we have to understand what is reservoir characterization. Reservoir characterization is, is mainly an integrated view of your reservoir integrated of all the aspects of data that you actually acquire in the reservoir. But in specific, there are be three sources of data that you really need to understand fully and to understand how to integrate these three sections or three directions of data uh, from your reservoir, working with different parties in your company, because you cannot do any reservoir characterization in isolation. It doesn't work. So you have to make sure that you're in contact with different uh, disciplines, different backgrounds, to really be able to uh, to identify your reservoir and characterize your reservoir properly. So let's just at, at least get a, uh, an overview of what are the data required to do a reservoir characterization. First of all, you have to res you have to understand your reservoir structure, the geological structure of your reservoir. I'm very sure you, every one of you studied at least one or two courses in uh, in reservoir geology. And we actually got introduced to different type of reservoirs. Starting from the anticline, which is a very basic reservoir. You probably not see this in many reservoirs, but this is one of the basic reservoirs that you see. Uh, any reservoir has to have a uh, source rock, a reservoir rock, and also seal rock. Okay? And if they are arranged in a very nice way, like you see it in the anticline here, this is an easy reservoir. And also you see the segregation of fluids where you can see the oil on the top of a gas cap. This is a very ideal reservoir in case you have it. But in many cases, we actually see some other reservoirs where fault systems happen. One of them is called the normal fault, and the other one is a thrust fault. So there are differences between normal fault and thrust fault when it comes to reservoir characterization. And I hope you guys, if you are not really familiar with these, I'm not sure if Dr. Ahmed uh, actually uh, had any geological uh, webinars before for you guys, but at least we need to go and review your reservoirs, at least the geological part of it, uh, that you studied in the undergraduate on the reservoir geology. Get yourself familiar with what are the differences between normal fault reservoir and a thrust fault reservoir. They are different in characteristics. We'll talk about this probably through the whole seminars through the month between uh, between all different uh, presentations. 
but uh, at least, and I just want to ask you guys if, uh, if you go ahead and review your basic geology and understand the different type of reservoir structures. The last one, but not the least, is the stratigraphic reservoir. It's also a, another reservoir that you need to understand. Stratigraphy reservoir is, is a very familiar reservoir. You see it in many places. So please, and I'm just repeating myself again, go ahead and try to find out your basic understanding, improve your basic understanding of the reservoir structure. But this is so critical when you go for reservoir characterization. When you drill a well, when you drill a well, where you drill it, are you, cut, are you actually going through a fault or not? Is this fault the normal fault? Is the thrust fault? What are the difference between these two? How this will affect my reservoir? How this will affect my reservoir properties? Very, very critical in reservoir characterization. Okay? So this is the first uh, piece of information that it should it need to be integrated in your reservoir characterization. Once you identify your geology of the reservoir, you start drilling. When you start drilling, we all start with exploration well. In exploration well, we actually get one very important piece of information in any exploration well, which is the full core. So the full core that we cut normally in any exploration well, it's a core that you take from the first well, full core with a certain diameter, certain length goes across your reservoir, you cut this one and actually the geologist will come in and describe this core. It's very, very critical to be with the geologist when he describes the core because the description of the core will affect your way of looking at your reservoir, your way of characterizing your reservoir. So the core is one very, very important piece of information that you have to be fully understand. So as you see right here, your work with the geology is a must. The geologists are very important input, or the input of the geologist is a very important input in any reservoir characterization. Okay. Once this is done, and the geologist actually uh, uh, looked at the core, slabbed it, and described it in a foot by foot, sometimes even less than a foot, to just understand what is this deposition, what kind of rock we're looking at, what kind of characteristics, at least from the view, uh, either by visual or under the microscope, you have to really understand that very, very well. Once this is done, there's also another role that the petrophysist will do with the geologist again, where they actually take plugs. As you can see here in the full core, you can see all these holes. In these holes, plugs are drilled in, and you actually generate group of plugs. The direction of the plug is very important. Is this plug actually horizontal plug? Is it a vertical plug? Is it a directional plug? And each one of these will have its own reasoning. For example, if I need to go for flow units, we will we'll talk about the word flow units through this course a lot, because the flow units are the units where your reservoir is producing. The capacity of your reservoir to produce, which is one of the most important parameters of reservoir characterization. What are the flow units of my reservoir? Horizontal uh, permeability and horizontal porosity are so important to understand. That's why some of the geologists with the reservoir characterization, with the petrophysicists, they work on picking these type of plugs. So some of the plugs are taken horizontally to look at the horizontal behavior of the rock. When the geologists see that there is some barriers in the vertical structure of the reservoir, then we take vertical plugs. So we take horizontal plugs for the flow units. We take vertical plugs for the connectivity between layers. We need to understand this and how this will affect the flow, the connectivity between the different layers in, in each reservoir. So actually, it's very important to look at where we took these plugs, how we took these plugs, what is the direction of this plug. Very important uh, piece of information that you need to integrate with your understanding of reservoir characterization. So the second input is the core from core description as a full core and measurement that you do in the plugs that you took with the geologist and the petrophysicist. You need to make sure you understand when you do this, on what basis you're doing it, and what are we looking at when we cut this, these plugs. Okay? Once you do this, to see this is the second piece of information that needs to be integrated in the reservoir characterization, then we drill wells. When you drill wells, actually, you acquire data. When you acquire data in the well, you acquire data across the lifetime of the well. It's not one single time data acquisition. 
you acquire data when you drill the well. We call this open hole data. That's before you case uh, the well, before you put the casing in there and you start production. So once you actually, uh, once you drill the well, you acquire data either by LWD data or wireline data. We call this open hole data. So the, the hole is still open. We didn't case the hole yet. So it's very important to look at every single well in your reservoir and you look at the data that you gather, integrate this data with the core data and with the geology. To read, if you are really wanted to look at your reservoir as a whole, to characterize your reservoir as a whole, how many wells you have in the field? Probably sometimes hundreds of wells. And you need to make sure every time you drill a new, a new well, you have to rebuild your understanding of reservoir characterization. Because every well is a piece of information that's added to the puzzle. That puzzle is your reservoir characterization. I need to understand this reservoir as a whole, not a single well. Information evaluation, when we looked at, a, at the formation evaluation webinar before, we talked about one single well. But field is not one single well. Wells are different. How we integrate these wells together? What is the connectivity between these wells? How this field is working? Which zone is talking to which zone? Which zone is flowing and which zone is not? That's what the reservoir characterization is all about. It ends up with optimizing my reservoir production. And that's the end game of any reservoir. I need to optimize production from my reservoir by really understanding my reservoir characterization. Okay. Once we acquire this data in open hole, and I said this is not the end of the data in any well, when you case the well, you need to go also with case the hole uh, uh, logging. Case the hole logging has different directions. Sometimes we use it for production to understand what's really going on inside my well bore. And also we need to look at my, my reservoir as well, who we'll case the whole reservoir logging. We need to look at the new distribution of my fluid in the reservoir, how the reservoir is changing its fluid distribution through production. When I produce, I produce fluids. What's, what's really happening? What does that change? Okay, where, where, where is the new distribution of flows in my reservoir? Very critical to so case the whole logging, which you continuously do. Sometimes we actually do it periodically. Every six months, sometimes we do it every year. It depends on how you're planning to look at your reservoir characterization. But case the whole is another piece of information that you need to be very aware of. And I think probably, we'll, I'm not sure if you already took also another a uh, course on uh, case the whole logging, especially the monitoring of case the whole logging, uh, how this will play a big factor on your reservoir characterization and your reservoir understand. Okay, let's just stick with the open hole data for now. And this is the open hole data. Well, once you get the open hole data, then your formation evaluation guy will come in and he try to look at your all, all analysis of all the data that you have. And he come up with a picture of lithology and fluid distribution. This is what I call initial, initial fluid distribution. Lithology is not going to change, but the fluid distribution will really change. So we need to take this and combine this into your understanding of the reservoir. You, you need this to look at the flow units of your reservoir. You need this to look at the statistical evaluation of your reservoir. So many inputs in any reservoir that will help you characterize your reservoir, optimize your production get the best out of your reservoir also as quickly as you can, okay? So the, the integration of the logging data with the interpreted data that the petrophysicist or the formation evaluation guy will do for you is a very big piece of information that you need to acquire into reservoir evaluation, <clears throat> okay? So all of these will be ending up, you will end up to look at the whole field. The whole field is just group of these wells that contain understanding of the reservoir structure, distribution of wells across your reservoir, the lithology and the fluid evaluation of your reservoir, the core analysis and core measurement of your reservoir and core description of your reservoir. Then you have a full reservoir with multiple wells. Now it's your role as a reservoir characterization engineer to integrate all of these to build a better understanding of the reservoir. And the end of the day, I need to look at the flow units of my reservoir, how these units are flowing, and how can I produce 
this this reservoir to its optimum capacity. Okay, so that's in general. What are we need? What do we need? And what is the meaning of reservoir characterization? Okay, with that said, I can actually summarize this into reservoir characterization is a full field analysis that integrates three inputs. First of all, the geology and the depositional environment, as we agreed on. Second, a reservoir rock properties, core analysis, full core analysis and description, and plugs measurement and description. Okay. Third is the formation evaluation logging. You have to integrate all of these to understand your reservoir. Okay. So simply, from a single well to multi-wells. Once you did this, every well you drill, you have to put this into your reservoir characterization and see Will this add any value to you? Will this change your understanding of your reservoir? Do you need to divide your reservoir into regions or into sub areas, into sub zones? You need to look at this very carefully to optimize the final product of what you have, which is optimizing my reservoir production. Okay? So field correlations is very important. How can I correlate between all these wells? On what basis should I correlate between all these wells? What are the methodologies do I need to use to correlate between these wells to come up with an understanding of the field? Okay. Second is the statistical evaluation. I know that you guys took a, a course on statistics. And the statistics, actually, we have two directions of statistics, and I need you guys to be aware of. Okay? We have what we call histogramming. Histogramming is a very simplistic way of looking at data. Okay. For example, I can histogram porosity of a well. I can histogram permeability of a well, clay volume of a well, uh, probably clay uh, uh, sand volume, uh, lime volume, whatever thing that you can look at uh, from the histogramming point of view. We also talk about this. But in this course, I will introduce you to another statistical, which is called variogram. Variogram is very important to the anybody who is doing reservoir characterization because the basic difference and listen to this carefully the basic difference between histogramming and variogram that the histogram does not take into consideration the spacing between wells histogram does not take into consideration the spacing between wells it looks at a well as a single well but variogram will look at the distribution of your of your wells from each other you have a hundred wells these hundred wells have different distances from each other how is my property is changing as a function of distance that's what the variogram is that's the one that you will rely heavily on understanding your reservoir characterization we will talk about this in some details later on so the variogram is a very very important i'm sure if you guys studied this in the in the course of the statistics or not but variogram, is, which is the variation in my reservoir as a function of the distances between wells. And that's more important. I'm not, I'm, saying, I'm not putting down the value of the histogram, no. But you have to start with the histogramming, which is a single well evaluation, to a variogram, which is a multi-well evaluation, taking into consideration the distances between my wells. So variogram is so critical to statistically understand the change of my parameters in my reservoir, and I do a lot of decisions based on the variogram. Okay? So how is this course will be uh, distributed? I'm going to go through this quickly before we start the first lecture. So the first lecture will go through multi-wells and field view. How can I look at the field view from, from multi-well point of view? Okay? This is, we will call it field cross-section. Today, we'll build a field cross-section. How can I build a field cross-section? Through multiple wells that I have on my field. Okay. Second lecture, will be talking about single well and multi-well lithology and porosity evaluation. We'll start looking at the, the, the change of lithology on a single well by single well, then how to correlate these across the field. Okay. Single well lithology is important. And I want to teach you in this course, or in this, in this class, which is lecture two, to teach you how to visually to train your eyes in capturing the change of lithology instead of depending on softwares. Softwares are good to have, 
but your eyes are much more important if it is trained, okay? If you rely heavily on softwares, guys, sometimes you make mistakes because as we all learn, and I learned this in, the, in many places, you call it G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. If you are not really know what you're dealing with, your eyes before your hands, you have to understand what you're looking at. You have to be capable of visualizing changes of lithology across your field with your eyes first before using your software. Okay? So this is a very important factor. And I will, I, will, I will teach you on how to do this on a visualization. How can you pick the limestone zones, sandy stone zones, dolomite zones, clay zones, how things are picked by your eye, not from the, from the software. Okay? How to calculate porosity for each well, then how to statistically integrate all of these in a multi-well processing. Okay? So field-wide lithology and field-wide evaluation will be covered in lecture two. In lecture three, you will talk about core to log calibration, which is a very important thing. Now, we talked about the multi-well, how to build cross-section, how we identify our lithology and our porosity, then how to correlate all of these to, law, to core. We actually spend so much money on the core, not to just, just for the fun of it or to just look at some pieces of rocks. No, this has to be calibrated to your reservoir, especially permitted. Why? Because this will go for something called zonation and flow units. From the permeability, we build zonation. We look at flow units. This is the one when we combine it on a field-wide, we will understand how my, our reservoir is performing, how our reservoir is producing. Then we look at the zone that requires some extra work to help it out, or the reservoir that's not contributing at all, or some of the reservoir that we, we leave to later Okay, do, don't do it today for many reasons like change of pressure. So many things, guys. And the way you look at the field as a whole that will help you out understand and optimize your reservoir production. Okay? So statistical evaluation of this will come up with the zonation, how we pick the zonation, how we do the, how we determine the flow units in our reservoir. In lecture number four, we'll talk about this specific about carbonates. Believe it or not, most of what you study undergraduate and sometimes even when you graduate, you, you actually pretty much based on plastic. Plastics, I'm not gonna say plastics are easy. Plastics also are difficult, but it's, not, but it's not as difficult as carbonates. Carbonates, as they always say in the industry, it's a different animal. Carbonate is really a different animal. So I will leave a full lecture on how we look at carbonate rocks, how we evaluate carbonate rocks. Because carbonate rocks are more complex than plastics. I'm not saying plastics are easy, but it's easier compared to carbonate rocks. So look at the deposition, what the, the type of processes in carbonate rock, type of lithology, what kind of saturation, how things are related together, what's controlling permeability, grain sizes, uh, pore sizes, all this kind of stuff, which is really a big issue when you look at, the, at, at carbonate reservoirs. So I will leave a full uh, lecture on carbonate reservoirs in specific because they, as I said, they are different animals when I compare it to plastic reservoirs. Okay? So the, the, the last one will be a Q&A. So once we have all these lectures, you come up with some questions. Uh, and also I will try to pick up some questions if, if there is some easy questions through, the, through the, um, uh, the lecture. But we'll leave a lot of questions to the very end, similar to what we did before. I will uh, leave one of them to uh, one uh, separate lecture where we can look at questions and answers. Okay? So this is this mainly the content of this course through the month of October. Okay? Right. So let's just start with looking at multi-wells. Let's just pay attention to what's coming here because it's very important to understand these concepts, how we look at multi-wells view, okay? which you call field correlation. There are very essential conditions to analyze any multi-well. Let's just give you an, 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 let me throw an example here. Well, in, in fields, you can actually have vertical wells. You can have deviated wells, or sometimes we call it slanted wells. You can have horizontal wells. You can have multilateral wells. Well, all these wells have different trajectory. How can I compare these wells with the our different trajectory? That doesn't make any sense. Okay? I cannot do that. 
Frankly, I cannot do that. I cannot compare data from a vertical well to data from a slanted well, data from a deviated well, data from a horizontal well. That's not going to work. We have to take away the variability between the different well trajectory. And that's the major thing. This is essential. You have to do this before you do anything else. And we'll spend the whole lecture today on talking about this essential. It's essential to remove all the other variables when you look at multi-wells analysis. Yeah? When I say this, all wells have to have the same trajectory. Then you have to start with what that doesn't make sense. I have vertical wells and I have deviated wells. What does this statement actually mean? All wells have to have the same trajectory. We need to explain this today. All wells have to same have to have the same trajectory. Okay? How we're gonna how we're gonna reach this? Well, that's what we will discuss today. Today. Second, you have when you look at integrating things, you have to integrate the reservoirs with the same geological and petrophysical properties. Then you also have to say, how can this happen? Okay, there are some variability in my reservoir. Yes, and that's why it's your role to look at this variability and to combine the variables that are the, the things that are that are alike together and the things that are different together. That what we call the flow units, things that have the same characteristics and the things that are different in characteristics. So first of all, you have to standardize the well trajectory. Second. You have to compare same animals together. I cannot compare uh, apple to orange. That doesn't work. Okay? So you have to standardize this. So before you do anything, a reservoir characterization, you have to remove all the variability to make your evaluation proper. Unless, unless, until you do this, your evaluation has no meaning whatsoever. Okay? So first, stick, first one. All wells have to be have the same trajectory. Then the question is, what trajectory? Well, all have to be vertical. All wells have to be vertical. Are you forcing me to drill every well vertically? No. I want you to analyze every well vertically. Big difference between forcing you to drill vertical wells and asking you to analyze vertical wells. You guys see the big difference here. I'm not going to say you need to drill every well vertically. That's crazy. That doesn't make sense. Okay? But I want you to evaluate and to correlate every well vertically. Okay? So that's the one that we talk, we're talking about. Then, you, as I said, how come? That, that doesn't make sense? No, it does make sense. What if all the wells are not vertical, deviated, or horizontal? That's what we will look at. Okay? Reality is you don't have all the wells vertical then we need to find out how can we do this? How can we look at all the wells vertically? Okay? Yeah. So this is the first thing. Everything has to be the same trajectory, and we chose that everything has to be vertical. Okay? Right. Second, integrate the reservoirs with the same geological and petrophysical property. You see? Another, how come? They are different. Then, what if the reservoir is heterogeneous? That's the, which is the reality. We need to know how we can correlate things that are heterogeneous, how to combine things that are similar and put them on the same correlation to come up with certain flow units and go for some other thing that also have the same correlation and so on. So that will, will, will this part, we we'll start talking about zonations, start talking about correlations, start talking about flow units. How can we build this and how can we integrate things together? So, to do a proper evaluation, you have to remove the variability. Okay? If you look at things that have variability, that's not correlation. That's, that's randomness. Okay? Correlation means you remove everything and you stick to certain type of trajectory, which would chose to be all vertical. Okay? All right. So let's just go and look at the well planning. Let's assume that I have a reservoir. This is my reservoir. Okay? And here is my reservoir thickness, right? Now, when I drill in my reservoir, I drill with different type of trajectories. The first one is a vertical one, okay? The distance that the well is passing through that reservoir, that section of the reservoir, we call it MD. So well, well one has a measured depth one. So every well has a measured depth. Measured depth is the distance that the well is traveling through my reservoir. 
If I have a vertical reservoir, so this is my measure depth, measure depth one, okay? Now, if I looked at well two, and well two is the deviated one, then where is the measure depth? That actually, that curve, it's not really a straight line anymore. That's called measure depth two. So what do you think? Is measure depth one equal to measure depth two? No, but they are going through the same zone, yes. But how can I compare now? I cannot really do this comparison. Yeah, I cannot. This one is traveling, let's say, 100, me 100 feet. This may be 120 feet, 125 feet. So measure depth two is greater than measure depth one. Very simple, okay? So how can I do this? Some something is traveling across my reservoir in a different way than the second well, and you're asking me to do any correlation. I cannot do this type of correlations. There is no way to do any of these type of correlations if my wells are not standardized on a certain well trajectory. Third, let's assume that your reservoir encountered the zone that's not part of your reservoir. Let's say it's a clay zone. That's not a productive zone anymore. Then what do you, what you need to do with this? Well, if you drill a, a vertical well or a deviated well, you're losing part of your reservoir. So how can I, how can I make up for this part that I already, I already lost? Then we all do with, uh, one number three, let's go horizontally. Let's, just, let's stay as long as we can in the zone of interest. So this or the planning that we do, combine my, our, our information, our interpretation of our reservoir, and we decide our well trajectory accordingly, plus some other things that the driller will take care of, how to drill a safe well without any collapsing, so many other things that like, like mechanical properties, but we'll leave this to the, to the drillers. But at least for the time being, where we are as reservoir characterization, I need to stay in my reservoir as long as I can stay to get the, as much production as I can get. Now, these three, when they actually had MD3, so MD1 is different than MD. MD stands for measure depth. So measure depth one, which is the actual depth that you measure while you're drilling your work, regardless if it's vertical or non-vertical, the distance that you actually stayed in your zone, this is called measure depth. So measure depth one is different than measure depth two. Probably, probably measure depth three is also the, the biggest one of them because I stayed in my reservoir as long as I can stay, taking into consideration the other reservoir parameters, which is the delta P and stuff. That's part you guys study in, in the drilling. But MD1 is different than MD2, is different than MD3. Now I cannot do any correlation whatsoever. I cannot do that. Something is wrong here. It's not the same trajectory. That's why people started talking about something else. Talking about we need to standardize that thickness of the reservoir. We call this thickness and that thickness. So we need to look at the, the vertical thickness that the reservoir, that the well went through. And we call this TVD. TVD stands for true vertical depth. You cannot do any correlation on measure depth, guys. Period. You cannot do any correlations on measure depth. You have to change the measure depth to true vertical depth. That's where you do your correlation. Everybody understand now? Because the change in trajectory is a variability. And I need to remove this variability somehow. So every, every type of correlation we do, we have to do a correlation on true vertical depth. So we need to spend some time to understand what is the true vertical depth. It's what is this? How we calculate this? What does it mean? Okay. So true vertical depth is the depth that you will use to do your correlation on. Everybody understand that? We do not do correlations on measure depth because they are different based on the world trajectory. Now, to standardize this, even if you have MD2, we need to calculate how much of the MD2 with respect to the TVD. TVD is the one I'm gonna do the correlation on. Everybody gets that? So we do correlations, guys, on true vertical depths, not on measure depths, okay? Now, all depths should be on true vertical depths TVD. Why? Measure depth MD does not reflect the zone thickness when deviated or horizontal. That doesn't, that doesn't do that. It actually exceeds this. And that exceeding, it may be misinterpreted as my reservoir thickness is too, too thick. That's not true. 
You just stay there with an angle and the angle give you the extra length of your reservoir, but your reservoir is the same thickness. It doesn't change thickness. So you have to remove this. So everything has to be on TVD. Second, through vertical depth, if the thickness consistent and realistic when you do the correlations and you do the statistics. Everybody understand that? So the first thing you have to keep in mind when you do any correlations in your reservoir as a reservoir characterization is to put everything in true vertical depth. Measure depth is not. Measure depth will be actually create a lot of un, uh, unrealistic type of interpretation. Okay. All right. So deviated wells. Let's just understand what is the deviated wells. Okay. Now let's assume that you actually drilling a well. When you drill a well, you drill from the surface, from a point on the surface. Then you start drilling and you take a certain trajectory. Every time you drill, you're intersecting with layers, okay? Here is one of the layers right here. Let's just go back to our basic geometry. Any plane, that's a plane, okay? This plane, I can characterize any plane by, let's go for the Cartesian coordinate, X and Y coordinate. I can characterize this as here two coordinates, okay, two axes. The first one is the xx, and the, one, the other one is the yy. Any plane, I can go there and I say xx, and the yy is orthogonal to s, perpendicular to this. The angle is 90 degrees, okay? So xx and yy. Then the line that's normal to it, we call it the z direction. This is the basic Cartesian coordinates. If I have a plane, this plane is the layers of your reservoir. If I have a layer in my reservoir, I can define this layer by x, x, y, y, and the perpendicular to it is z. Now it comes up to a very important question. Who's gonna, who's gonna decide the direction of x, x, and y, y? Actually, if you decide one of them, then all of them are known. For example, if I decided xx, then all you need to do is a 90 degree line uh, over the xx will give you the y1. And z is the perpendicular one. So knowing one of them, one axis only, you will be able to get the three axes altogether. If I told you one single axis, then the three dimension will be built. Because if I know xx, I know y1. It's 90 degrees over, uh, uh, over it. I know zz, which is the perpendicular on the plane. If I know y, y, I know x, x. It's the, it's the same, same thing. You have to tell me either x, x or y, y. Okay? So the industry, the industry got agreed on something very important. Okay? One of the axes that we will use is north-south. So north-south is our main axis. Everything will be measured from north. So north is what the industry chose as the reference of measurement. Everybody understand that? So the industry chose north as the, as the reference of measurement. Then if I know the north south, which is the magnetometer will do that for you. Any magnetometer will tell you here is the north, okay? So knowing the north is not a very, very, very big thing. We all know the north. Once you know the north and the south, then the east and the west are north. So I know my x, x, y, y. So in our drilling, we don't use x, x, y, y anymore. We use north, south, east, west. Because north, I know where is the north. Okay? I can get the north in any place on earth. I can get the north. So the north is the reference of measurement. All our measurements are based on north. Okay? So north is our reference of measurement. Then... East and west are, are perpendicular to the north and, and, and south. So in this case, I found out this. Z is known, okay? Z is known. Now, if my well landed here, if my well landed here, where is the angle of my well that landed at this point? Well, you measure this angle from the north. So this is the angle. So if anybody told you that the angle is this, and I'll call this angle a name, we call this the azimuthal angle. So if anybody told you that the azimuth angle of the well is 30 degrees, it's a 30 degrees measure from the north, without even mentioning this anymore. This is a standard in the industry. So if I told you that the azimuth angle is 30 degrees, 
It's 30 degree measured from the north. And it's measured clockwise. Don't ask me why. I still have a problem with, with the drillers in this. We all measure anti-clockwise except for the drillers. But that, that's, that's a different issue. Okay? I always joke with the drillers on this. Okay? Everybody in the whole science community, we measure anti-clockwise except for the drillers. They measure clockwise from the north. So you come from the north and you go clockwise to where your well is, and that's your azimuth angle. So the azimuth angle is the trajectory of my well on my plane. So you have a different azimuth angle for every plane you intersect. And this angle is measured due north. So this means you go from the north and you measure where you are, where this tangent of your well is from the north. That we call the azimuth angle. Okay, now your well also will be deviating from the Z direction. From the Z direction, it actually measured the angle and we call this inclination angle. So we define every well by two angles, an inclination angle and an azimuth angle. The inclination angle is the angle that the well is making with the Z direction. The, the azimuth angle is the projection of the well on the plane I'm looking at with respect to north, okay? So that's basic, don't ever forget them. So when you hear the word azimuth and you hear the word inclination, that's what they mean, okay? All right. So these are the basics that we all need to understand first before we do anything, okay? Now, let's just apply this to one of the wells. This well is actually going through this plane, okay? I will go through this in details, guys, so pay attention to this, right? So this means here is our axis, Axis now is not X, Y anymore. It's north, south, east, west. That's what we agreed on. North, south, east, west, everything is, is measured from the north. So my well is going through this plane. The plane represents a layer of my layer after layer after layer after layer and so on. Okay? So that's why your well is changing as much as it goes through the, the reservoir. Okay? This, end, this one will have a tangent. The angle with um, from your tangent to this, that's what you call the azimuth. Then you come to the well and you have another tangent. The tangent of your well at the point is called the inclination. So every time you come at any depth, you take a tangent at the depth and you measure the angle with the Z. That's your inclination angle. You come to the landing, okay? That layer that you want to see the how things are going. You Take a tangent here, you measure the angle from north, clockwise from north, and we call this the azimuth angle. So we have the azimuth angle and the inclination, inclination angle, as per the well trajectory that we see right there, okay? All right, so now, if I take a point like this point and another point like this one, the distance from this point to this point, that's a measured depth, okay? So this is a measured depth. Where is the TVD? TVD is you take this distance, that's the vertical distance, that's what we call TVD. Now we need to know, how can I calculate the TVD out of the MD? Okay, how can I calculate the TVD out of the MD? That's actually, many companies do this, they call it the survey. Okay? They do survey, we'll talk about this in a second. I'll show one of the survey examples, how people look at this, yeah? So this is your measure depth, that you cannot do any correlation on this measure depth. You have to change this to TVD for your correlation to make sense, okay? Because if you go this MD, the, the wheel is going in this direction, and will go in the other direction, it will be completely a mess, okay? But whatever the direction is, they will all will give you the same TVD when you go and you measure the true vertical depth, okay? All right. So how we calculate the true vertical depth? This is a very important thing. So we understood now, well trajectory, we understood what does what the measure depth mean, and why do we need the TVD to just remove all these variations to get a standardized depth that we can correlate with, which is the true vertical depth. Yeah? How to calculate TVD? There are multiple methods to calculate TVD. You, many methods, actually. They are, they are different in what? Accuracy, okay? I will go through all this method and I will stick with one of them, okay? It doesn't matter what, if you know so many or many of them. Actually, I'll stick with one of them that's mostly used in the industry. 
We have the you have the ang the average angle method, the tangential method, the balanced tangential method, the radius of curvature, and the minimum curvature. I like the minimum curvature myself because it does make more sense to me. Okay. So the minimum curvature is the one that we're gonna look at and we see how we can calculate our TVD from the minimum curvature uh, method, yeah? Now, here's an example. I will show this example to you guys. I hope that it will be coming up. Uh, can anybody tell me, is that is that clear now? Is everybody see this uh, survey? Uh, Roussel, can you, can you see the survey, please? Can you co confirm this? Uh, not yet, Doctor. Oh, you don't I see can that? see example, but no. Yeah, you don't see the uh, the Schlumberger. No. Okay, hold this. Let me let me uh, think. I need to change the sharing. Hold just one second. Okay. Uh, let me go here. Let me go. Still can see this. No. It's loading. Not not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me let me do one thing. Okay. Just uh, let me let me do one thing. Hold just one second. Uh, I will get out of the sharing first. Okay. And then I will I will do one thing quickly because I need everybody to see this. Right. Let me get out of the sharing. Mm -hmm. Just one second. Now let me go back here, and we go there. Don't know in a minute. Okay. Can you now see this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here is an actual survey that Schlumberger did for a company. I just removed the company name for confidentiality. And as you see right there, actually, they said that the survey is a minimum curvature. So one of the things that when you get these from any service company, they will actually tell you which method they use. So they use the minimum curvature. As you will see right there, there's an MD, which is the measure. That's the same thing that we've been discussing now. Here is the MD. Here is the inclination angle. Here is the azimuth angle. Here is the TVD. I'm sorry. Here is the TVD. Here is the vertical section. Here is the north south. Here is the east west. So the actually all what we talked about is listed in these type of surveys. Okay. So the surveys is something very critical for anyone who is working on any deviated well. If you have a deviated well, don't ever do any type of analysis on a deviated well unless you ask for the survey and you make sure that you can have the TVD in your database because making any type of correlation not on TVD is not really going to be working. It's, it's a big mistake, right? So here is the, an example, the example that's done by Schlumberger for a certain company that shows all the variability that we've been talking about, okay? So let me stop this sharing and go for the other one, back again. Okay. So we said that multiple methods actually, and we'll look at an example. Sorry, sir, just, just be with me. Are, are we all back now for the PowerPoint, is it clear? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Now, how we calculate this? Let's assume that I have this well. Okay. This will actually have a first point, second point. We call this one MD. Let's just try to blow this MD a little bit. Okay. Let's just make it bigger. So this is the piece of MD. Guys, one by one, please pay attention of how we do this because it's very critical. I saw many mistakes in many actually surveys because sometimes, they, you know, some people are not very uh, uh, meticulous in the way they do, they do things. So make sure you understand what these things are. 
So here is the piece of the well. Here is the here is the small piece of the well that I want to calculate the measure depth for it. As you can see, it's a curvature here. So we need to calculate what is the measure depth. First of all, you have to build you have to build like a parallel pipe around this. Uh, a rectangular, if you're gonna say a rectangular is 2D, but this is say it's a rectangular here. Okay, where and have to be, look at this very carefully. Where your well is the diagonal of this shape. The well is the diagonal. Look at this. This is the first part. It's not going to this part. It's going to that one. So this point is connected to this point as a diagonal of this shape. So you imagine, you see, putting putting a, a, a cube. Let's call it a cube here to make it easy. We're putting a cube around your your uh, uh, curvature here, which is actually a par parallel pipe. So it's just call it a cube for the for the time being. So where this section is the diagonal. Everybody understand that? Okay. Now here is your first point, which is this one, and here is your second point. So that's two first point and the second point are the diagonal of the shape I'm, I'm drawing. All right. Second, just complete this of, of the of the cube of the or the parallel pipe as, as we say. Okay. Now you come at this point. And you see, this is the Z direction, right? You put a tangent at this point. Here is the tangent at this point. The, the, the angle between the tangent and the Z direction is your first inclination. This inclination one. So this is I1. This is the inclination angle at the start of this curvature. You do the same at the end of the curvature. Also, you draw here the Z line and you get the tangent at this point to, to the curve and you create i2 so for this piece because they are different in shape they are not a straight line they are curvature then there is an i1 and i2 there's an inclination one and inclination two is this clear to everybody so every two points on any curvature they have an inclination one which is the the angle between the tangent which is this tangent at the first point and the z direction, and the tangent of the line at the second point and the z direction. This is I1 and this is I2. Inclination one and inclination two. Okay? Now, you need to get the projection of this uh, diagonal on the, that, that direction and the upper direction, at the lower, lower, the base and the surface. So let me, let me take, first of all, the projection of this one on the surface. Look at this. Now, where is the angle? Where is the north? Here is the north. Now, the projection with the north will give you the Z1, the azimuthal one. So what is the azimuthal one? We, any azimuth is measured from north. So you get the projection of this because this is a diagonal. So the projection will be the diagonal on the surface. So the diagonal on the surface will actually make an angle of the north, and this is called Z1, okay? You get the projection of this on the base, which also will be the other diagonal, and you go for the north, and you get the Z2. So you have Z1 and Z2. You have the azimuth 1 and azimuth 2. You have inclination 1 and inclination 2. So every two, every piece of curvature in nature, can be characterized with two inclination and two azimuths. I1 and I2, Z1 and Z2. Once you decide this, then I don't want to go through equation, but these are the equations. Delta TVD, you can calculate it from. Delta MD, you know the measure depth. Let's say I'll, I'll take this two feet. So this is this two feet, you put the two feet here. What is the inclination one? What's the inclination two? You measured inclination one and inclination two. So I1 plus I2 over 2, you take the cosine of it, you give you the T delta T V D. What is the projection to the east and what's the projection to the north? Okay, projection to the north is delta M D sine I plus I1 plus I2 over 2, cosine Z1 plus Z2 over 2. I don't want you to go through how these things are derived. It's too complicated for, for the class. I don't want to go through this, this math, but I want you to understand what is I1 and what's I2? What is Z1 and what's Z2? And these equations are everywhere in the books. All what's not in the books is the understanding. 
how we generate I1, how we generate I2, how we explain Z1, how we explain Z2. Once you understand these angles, then go ahead and plug in this equation. I don't want you to waste your time to know how these equations are derived. That's not, that's not the issue, okay? These, these equations are in the, in the textbooks, but the understanding, as I said, is not in the textbook. It has to be in your mind. So you understand I1 and I2, Z1 and Z2, then you use the equation, okay? Let me take an example of this. Say, determine the delta TVD, delta north and east for two feet MD. Let's take two feet MD, measure depth. If I1 is this, I2 of this, Z1 of this, and Z2 of this. So you take actually two points. Here is the, the three equation. We take two points. This distance is two feet, measure depth. And I need to find the delta TVD. And he gave me I1 and I2. So all I need to do is, I'll say, okay, First of all, delta T V D is this. Delta, what's a measure depth? Measure depth is two feet. Cosine 32 by over, plus 40 over two should be here over two, sorry. Should be here over two. Then it will be 1.618. So that two feet will be 1.6 feet T V D, which is expected. T V D has to be less than than the measure depth. Okay. So guys, this is my I'm sorry, this is a process for this mistake. So I1 plus I2 over two. Should be half of this. Okay. So cosine. 1.618 gives you the delta TVD is shorter than this. You need to do the same here. Sine 30 plus over 2, sine 25 by plus, uh, uh, plus 20 over 2. It gives you the delta east and gives you the delta north. So once you know I1, I2, Z1, Z2, it's easy to calculate the delta, delta TVD. Okay? So the calculation of the true vertical depth is not really uh, difficult, but I want you to understand what is the delta through vertical depth? It's very, very important to know that you will not and cannot, and please do not do any correlations on any measure depth. That's not acceptable because there are lots of variation. That's why you need to remove the variation by creating the true vertical depth. Okay? okay. So, multi well correlations and cross sections. What do I mean by this? Here is a, here is a field. Now, I have multiple wells. Now, for example, I need to look at what's really happening across the field at this distance or at this layer or at this uh, uh, cross section. So once I put a line here, I need to look at my reservoir through this line if, as, if, as if you're putting a plane across your reservoir, as if you're building a wall across your reservoir. I need to look at the projection of my wells across this wall to really understand what's happening with all these wells clo clo close to this wall, okay? We call this cross-section, okay? All right. So let's just start, let's just start that I, I drilled the first one. So here is well number one. When you need to do correlation between wells, guys, you need to use some type of parameters, some type of measurement. We normally do this on gamma ray. For example, I need to correlate lithology. I need to correlate the clay zones versus the non-clay zone, okay? So my goal in this example is to look at the clay zone versus non-clay zone. How can I do that? First, you go to first well number one. You say, okay, here is my well number one. Now, I need to decide at what depth I need to do the correlation. Remember, if this will measure depth or TVD, someone tell me. Can I do any type of correlation on measure depth? No. So this has to be TVD depth. So before you put any logs for correlation between wells, this well has to be TVD. So this depth cannot be measure depth. This depth has to be TVD depth. Okay? So I put my well on TVD, first well. Then I have to say, at what level I need to compare? You have to choose a depth. Let's say 6,000 feet. 6,000 feet of what? Of TVD as a hanging. At 6,000 feet, this is my hanging line. And I see everything below that, how they correlate with each other. You cannot do this correlation unless they are all on true vertical depths for the correlation to be meaningful. So I put everything on two or two vertical depths, and I chose 6,000, for example, as a hanging line. This means the second well, when I drill it, I have to bring the well also on TVD 
and also starting from 6,000 feet to compare apple to apple. So the first well is on TVD. I need to see from 6,000 all the way down. Then any other well that will be added to your correlation, it has to be on, six, on TVD and hanging from 6,000 feet to do the correlation. Okay? Yeah. So this is my correlation line. And here is my well on TVD. Okay? Let's just take a look at this. My gamma ray here is what? Is low gamma ray, followed by a high gamma ray, followed by a low gamma ray, followed by even a lower gamma ray. Then in gamma ray increased back again. So I can do put this imagination at the beginning. Why am I saying imagination? Because I have only one single well. I don't have much of information. When you get the second well, your imagination will become closer to reality. Third well will enhance it more. Fourth well, you enhance it more and more. And that's why every time you drill a well and you put it into your correlation, you understand more and more and more of your reservoir and you see how things are, are connected. Let's just continue on this example because it's very important. So this one has a low gamma ray. I will actually consider this. So this is the hanging data. Okay. So let's just consider this a zone on its own and give it a different color. Call it anything you like. Okay, for the, for the time being. I'm not really interested in the naming so far. Here is my low gamma ray. So I call this zone. They are acting the same. So this is a good zone. I give it a different color. Now, this zone is higher gamma ray. Okay? It's probably a clay zone. Okay? Call it anything you like. So this zone will have it a different color. So now I'm zoning my reservoir on TVD to remove any other variability in my rock in my field, right? So this is a second zone. I will take this one and I consider it because it's different than the previous one. So it is a different zone. And this one is getting much cleaner, so I give it a different zone. This one is getting more, more higher, getting higher in gamma ray, so I take it a different zone. So this is the first look. Here is the first look for my reservoir. Just very basic. I have I cannot do anything more because it's only one single well. Nobody can do better than this. Okay, until I go in my reservoir and drill a second well. Now, when I drill a second well, I will see how things are related now, because here is my well and here is a second well distant from each other. Let's just see the variability now and see how my reservoir is built. So the condition is. I put the second well in here. What is the condition of my second well? Has to be on TVD. This is the one, first one. Second has to be hanging from 6,000. So here is my TVD. Well is my TVD and it's hanging on 6,000. Now I can compare. If I'm not doing this, I cannot do these correlations whatsoever as a characterization of a field-wide multi-well characterization. How my, my reservoir is acting together. If you look at this, here is my 6,000. Look, did I get this clean zone here? No. Actually, I started with what? I started with the high gamma ray zone. Man, seems like I lost this zone in the second well. That's how we look at the structure of the reservoir, guys. Look at the, the variability of my reservoir. This is how I characterize my reservoir. The zones are pinching out. The zones are, that are extending. The zones that are thickening, the zones that are thinning, these are the things that we all look at, okay? So this zone disappeared, but this zone is probably is the one that's correlated to that zone from the gamma ray point of view. So this zone is disappearing, going where? Going west. So the clean zone that I saw disappeared going west. It's actually the completely gone here, for example, okay? Now... If I look at this zone, I can correlate it with that zone. It says a little bit of high, higher gamma ray, but it takes the same shape. We're going up and down, increasing a little bit. Now, I'm getting to the clean zone here. Look at this clean zone. Correlates with that clean zone. They correlate with something I noticed. I noticed the high gamma ray here, which means a, sh a little bit of a shale zone started to build up, but it's not extending to here. So I can say... This one started to build up, but it actually pinched out. It's not going to the second one. See how, the, how we build our correlations. Now, 
if I need to put a well in between these two wells, I'm putting my new well of knowledge. I know how my reservoir is working. I know that I lost this zone, for example. I know when I drill a well in between, I can predict the new deposition that I will see between these two wells. That's why when we build our reservoir characterization, we actually improve our drilling capability. We improve our reservoir exposure capability by building these type of correlations, okay? Continue on this, though this, this high gamma ray behavior is this high gamma ray behavior. I took it as one zone. This zone actually, I saw a clean zone here. It's pinching out, it's not really appearing much, so it's pinching out. And another high gamma ray zone, I didn't see it here. So this one building there. So I can see now variability between these two things, okay? So what is the extension to the left? I have no idea. I will extend it this way because I don't have an, another well that can tell me what's happening. All I have is two wells. When I drill a third well, probably uh, to the left of, of well two, I may understand better, okay? Right? Now, let's, uh, let's say, assume that I drilled well number three to the east of well number one. Now, I will try to find out what's happening in here. I built these two together. Now, I drill the one east to this well to understand what's going on in my reservoir. So, every well you drill, you actually go back to your cross-sections and see how things are changing. When I need to drill a well, I have to go to the, uh, to the wells that existing, see how they correlate together. So, I can expect before I drill, I can expect the thickness of my reservoir. I can expect the, the extension of my reservoir. I can do a lot before I drill a hole. I can go and choose the best position of my well based on my understanding of how things are correlated together, based on TVD correlations, not on measured depth correlation. Now I put the third well again on TVD. Nothing is all, and also on 6,000 data. And I found that this gamma ray here, look at this gamma ray and this gamma ray, they are correlated. Probably these two are correlated with a little bit of higher. You can see this one and this one are more correlated to each other. Okay, and this one is getting cleaner a little bit. Then this uh, uh, high gamma ray that I saw there is actually showing up here and going opposite. Then this one is a second op uh, shape of, of this. The, the, the three of them are showing the same shape. So they correlate with each other. This one is pinching out. This one is building again. So I can see that I can build a certain, uh, uh, going east now, I don't have any other wells. So I extend them horizontally. I have no clue what's going on. So I can build what we call cross-sectional shape. Okay. So if you look at this, I can say, well, it seems like there's a fault here because I can see things are dropping. Okay. So this, uh, this actually gave me an idea. This probably be a fault in this section. Yeah, right. So this is how I built the 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 the, uh, the hanging and, uh, and and looking at the reservoir deposition in this case. Let me go for an actual field example, and I will I will close with this actual field example. Here is a field that's in Egypt without saying where it is. Here is a field in Egypt that has five wells. Okay, okay. There are some five wells here, right? And I found something very interesting in the map, that the map is showing a fault in here, right? And I can see some wells are on that side of the fault, and I can see two wells are on the other side of the fault. How can I relate these things together? How can I build my imagination of this? How can I build the relationship of O, okay? So what we did actually, that we fully analyzed all these five wells. And let's pay attention to what I'm saying here. We fully analyzed all these wells. From the lithology point of view, from the uh, uh, fluids point of view, and that's the, the, that's the subject we're going to cover on in, in the next lecture. But let's assume now I calculated for all the full analysis of all these five words. Okay? Remember, there is a fault in here. Will I be able to predict this fault or not? Let's just see how that goes. If nobody told me there is a fault here, I will tell the geologist and the geophysicist you guys are missing a fault. Based on the logging data and my correlations, you guys need to go and review your understanding of your reservoir because your understanding is not complete. 
I can see from the logging data that I'm characterizing and from the, from the correlation I'm building, something is not right in the picture if they did not put this fault in there, okay? Let's see how this happened. First of all, I need to choose a datum and let's assume that I looked at the tops and the bottoms of my, of my reservoir. My reservoir is, is, is Harita 2D, whatever. This is the a reservoir in Egypt. Now, I look at the tops of all the reservoirs and the bottom of all the reservoir, okay? And here are measured depths. Why? Because all these wells are vertical. So don't worry about the TVD. All the wells are vertical. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay. So here is 12171 is the shallowest top of all. So I will hang my wells on 12171. And the deepest bottom of all is 12413. So I will hang my, my bottom to 12450. So now I'm just put the top and the bottom of my hanging. And everything has to be on TVD. In this case, I don't need to worry about it because all the wells are vertical. So that's, that's good news. Right. So when this actually was done, this is well one, well two, well three, well four, and well five. Full analysis of these five wells. Okay? And this is actually done at the AUC, by the way, for the undergraduate students. Okay? As you can see right here, here is our sand. All right? The sand is actually, uh, this is the top of the sand. You can see a lot of uh, clay zones at the bar, at the top here. Everybody knows me. I don't say shale zones. I say clay zones. Now, let's just correlate things together. Where is the, where is the hanging, hanging, hanging here? This is the hanging line. Hanging line starts at 12,150. Where is the bottom that we chose? We chose the bottom at 12,450. So now everything is on TVD. Or everything here is on MG because they are vertical. So there is no point of changing. Measure dips and if it's vertical, it's the same as TVD. Excellent. So I have 12,150, 12,450. Right? Let's just try to correlate between the sands now. Here is the top of the sand here. Okay? Where is the top of the sand here? Here. Is. So this one will go up to this point. So this, this sand is correlating with this sand. Where is the top of the sand here? It's very high. So I have to go all the way up. Here is the top of my sand. Can, can you see now how things are correlated? So this is the top of my sand in well one, well two, well three, I have to go up. Okay. How about this one? Well, a little bit but still up, a little bit down. And where is this one? Here is this, here is the, the sand on the, on, the, on the third one. Where is the bottom of this sand? The bottom of, sea, of this sand is here, which is the top of this shale zone. Here is the bottom of my sand, correlates where? Correlates with the bottom of that sand, and here is a little bit of a shale here. This shale is that, that shale, and it goes to this one because this is the bottom of the sand. Here is the shale. See how we build the correlations? Here is the bottom of the sand, here is the shale, and so on. Then, where is the bottom of that shale? Here is the bottom of this shale, correlates with the bottom of that shale, correlates with the bottom of that shale, correlates with the bottom of that shale, and so on. You keep going, it is the sand, the bottom sand, correlates with that sand, correlates with that sand. See how I'm building my correlation? This is how I understand my reservoir, how I characterize my reservoir. Here is the, here is the shale, look at, look at this shale. This shale is absolutely extending here with a very thick shale. Okay? It goes here with a much thicker shale, goes here with a much thicker shale, and so on. So I started building this correlation. But I found something very interesting here. What's interesting? That these two wells are actually going down. That the, the, the reservoir is deeper, while the reservoir here is shallower. So my reservoir here is in this section deeper than this section. What does it mean? It means you have to have a fault. It's as simple as such. That fault is the one. Here is the upper, the, this is the up throne, and this is the down throne. So this part is the down throne of the fault. This part is the up throne of the fault. Then if the geologist did not pick this, or if the geophysicist did not pick this in his geophysical analysis of the field data from the seismic data, because probably in some faults, the resolution of the, of the geophysics or the, or the seismic data does not allow you to pick certain type of faults, that the, the, the characterization person should be able to pick this from his correlation. 
So we under, that's why we get all the geology, the geophysics, the characterization, the logging, everything is cooked in your reservoir characterization. So I characterize the reservoir. I predicted there is a fault here. But thanks God, they already picked up the fault. They knew there are three wells that are in one direction. And we can see these three wells are in one direction and two wells in the other direction. We can see that clearly on the data. Okay, So we can see three wells are on one side of the fault and two wells are on the other side of the fault. That confers clearly from logging and from seismic, from geology, there is a fault in here. And that's the beauty about the reservoir characterization. You build your full understanding and you combine this with the geology, you combine this with the geophysics, you combine this with the formation evaluation, you combine this with the core data, you come up with full understanding of your reservoir and better characterization of your reservoir. So here is the four that we've been talking about, and here is the one that we predicted and we built it on our understanding. So what are the steps? The steps is to look at all your wells Look them at a certain type of cross-section. You have to hang them at a certain depth. You have to make sure all of them are on TVD unless you are lucky and your field is all vertical wells because the wells that we have here are all vertical wells, so they were lucky. So all these wells, when they build your correlation, you build your correlation on these things. Hanging, TVD, Build the correlation and see how these wells are related to each other. And that gives you a better understanding of your reservoir characterization. Okay, I will end this uh, lecture with this. Good enough for today. So you guys at least have uh, uh, the basics of things. You know what the TVD is. You know what the reservoir characterization is. You know what is the hanging point. How we calculate the TVD. How we do the, uh, what, what is the, uh, the inputs that all the reservoir characterization are requiring from the geology, from the petrophysics, uh, from the, uh, uh, the core analysis, all these data are combined together to build your understanding of the reservoir characterization. Thank you very much. If Thank there is a question or two, uh, Roussel, I'll be happy to, uh, to take a question. Yeah, we have some questions for you, doctor. Uh, first question from Amani. She said, could you tell me please why we are the rolls wells in horizontal way? Uh, can, can you say the question again, please, if you don't mind? Yeah. Uh, she asked why we draw wells in horizontal way. In horizontal way, why we drill wells in horizontal way? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, I answered that. Could you go back uh, to this slide because it, again, I will I will explain it maybe one or twice. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. See the the, the reason is here. If you, look, if you look at this. Here is my reservoir. Okay. Originally, originally, my understanding of the reservoir is say it's it's a hundred feet thick, okay, hundred feet thick of a zone. But while I was doing my evaluation, I found that there is a layer. Look at this layer here. This layer I put it there as a clay zone. We are not producing from clay zone. What does it mean in this case? I lost part of my reservoir. Correct. My reservoir here was thick. My reservoir here is getting thin. Actually, we go with horizontal wells when our reservoirs are thin. When I have a thin reservoir, if you drill a well vertical in a thin reservoir, imagine how much production you will get. Absolutely nothing. Okay? So you actually wasted your money in drilling a, a, a vertical well. But if you actually put your horizontal well in this very thin layer and you stay in this layer as much as you can, now you exposed your well to a much bigger zone so you can produce more. So the, the, the basic understanding of horizontal wells is we actually encounter small zones. Okay? We encountered small zones. Or sometimes we say, sometimes I have a thick reservoir, but it's actually a layered reservoir. It's a sand shale, sand shale, sand shale. If I go to this reservoir, okay, 
For example, there is a reservoir in Egypt here called Abar Bahariya. Abar Bahariya is the same way. Abar Bahariya is, as, an, as a reservoir, it's a sand shale thin layer. It means sand layer, which is full of hydrocarbon, shale layer, it doesn't produce anything, followed by another thin layer. Now, vertical wells is not going to do much for me, actually. The, the best way to do it is to go for a horizontal well and do fracking. Now, you actually fracking, you connect everything together. You connect all these layers together. So planning for horizontal well, it requires reservoir understanding. It, re it, it requires input from reservoir characterization. So one of the reasons is you're getting a thin zone or layered reservoir. So many reasons that will, it will make us go for horizontal wells, okay? Or sometimes very tight reservoirs go horizontal wells and do multi-stage multi, multi -stage frack, M many reasons. But for the time being, as a, somebody is starting, starting reservoir characterization, if I see some, something like this, this well was lucky because it's exposed to a very thick layer. But if I put a vertical well here, I'm really in deep trouble because I lost my reservoir. So I should not actually do a vertical well here, but I will actually go with a horizontal well and stay in this very little piece of the reservoir that's already staying here, stay in it as much as I can. Okay? All right, Rosa. Yes. Okay, the second question, how is the court taken in the exploratory well while it's very expensive? And what if the well is dry? Okay. Actually, that's, that's a very good question. Well, guys, when you, when, when you get into the industry, the most expensive well in your industry life is exploration well. Okay? We put everything in exploration well. Okay? And also, we call the exploration well, <clears throat> okay? I say we, we consider it a dry hole. What do you mean a dry hole? We, when, when we drill a, 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 an exploration well, we drill it as if it is a dry hole and will never produce. To all this assumption with exploration. Exploration, you have no idea, I have no idea. But from the geology, I'm sorry, from the geophysics and the seismic data, they told that there is, there is a potential there. But remember, the potential there, this word of potential there that comes from geophysics came from the measurement at the surface. So this means there is a lot of interpretation going on. And if there is an interpretation which is a human factor put into your evaluation, then there is a source of error. Okay? So we go there saying, ah, probably these guys are correct. Probably I have accumulation of hydrocarbon downhole. But to prove it, you have to drill. But that's a fact. You go there and drill. Once you drill, you have to also to take core. Okay? Because if you found it, don't lose it. Okay? You have to take the core because core is very important. You may understand more from the core for some extension of your reservoir or whatever. So when you plan for exploration, well, guys, you plan it as a dry hole. Nobody is expecting production from exploration well. Exploration well is the data gathering well. You gather as many data as you want. And this is the most expensive well, okay? And once if it is a production, it pay it for itself. But every company put budget for exploration. That budget, actually, the return of the, bu the budget is assumed to be zero because budget for exploration is not a budget to make money from. If every company put a budget for exploration well. That's, what, that's how, how, how the business is run. So I told you, exploration well is actually drilled as a dry hole well, not a producing well. Okay? All right? Okay. Uh, how gamma ray log have TVD instead of MD as it goes inside the well bore and our well well is inclined? Come on, that's a question of somebody who did not attend the lecture from, from the beginning. We calculate the TVD from the measure depths. We get the projection of the M measure depths as a TVD. We calculated this. We said there are six methods of doing this. We actually get the projection as if you get a line and you get a projection of the line on the Z direction. 
any line that has an angle with the z direction you have a projection of the line on the z direction that projection is called tvd we actually calculate the tvd from the measured depth and there is a there is a problem in the assignment of how to calculate tvd from a measured depth we do the calculation okay every company has what we call survey survey is calculating the projection of the measured depth on the z axis for correlation okay okay, Rosa. okay. yeah uh, there's a question about hanging depth when logging is done do we insert their evaluation level and put the standard uh, and put it to the standard c level reference or work as they are it depends it depends okay people actually put it on c level yes i am i'm also doing doing things on c level yeah c level is a good level to standardize you're absolutely right but when when i say when you hang the wells we are not hanging from surface that doesn't make sense now if i drill the well let's assume I, if i drill the well and I, the, the well is ten thousand feet and my reservoir is not at 9500 feet from 9500 feet to 9700 feet Okay, what's the point of hanging the well from the sea level? What's the point? I have I have 9,600 feet of nonsense. My reservoir is 100 feet from 9,600 to 9,700. So why should I look at the rest of it? Let me concentrate on my reservoir. That's why we get a hanging point on the top of my reservoir. My reservoir top is 9,600 feet to 9,700 feet. So what's the point of looking at other junk of rock? that doesn't have any value to me, okay? So that's why we chose the hanging line, okay? All the, everything is measured on TVD again, and the hanging line is on TVD on the top of my reservoir, okay? If I have different tops because of the variation across my reservoir, I take the shallowest one. Let's assume I have top at 9600, top at 9620, top of 9640. So I don't go for 9640 because this means I'm missing the 9600. So I go for the 9600, the shallowest one, to see everything related to each other. Okay? Okay. We have so many questions, but I'll ask can, the... Can, uh, can, another two, maybe? Or the... It's, yeah. it's okay. I'm, uh, we have at least at least five minutes to go. Okay. That's good. Um... Okay, could you please explain based on which criteria the shell zone are the differentiate from the sand zone at the log? That's next time I will spend, I said, the next lecture. Are these guys getting in late or what? I don't know. In the next lecture, we will talk about identification. As I said, you are, I, will, I will let you learn how to identify the lithology by bare eyes first before you use your logs on any software. We have to learn how to identify lithology, differentiate between shale, between sand, between lime, between dolomite. We need to make sure you guys learn how to do this, these things by your bare eyes. And that's really the content of the next lecture. Okay. Uh, why we just use gamma ray for correlation? Why not SP or any other log? SP, nobody uses SP, guys. And I, I always get annoyed when somebody mentioned SP or somebody the other day was mentioned SNP, which is sidewall neutron. Guys, nobody's using SP anymore, okay? If you go to any company now to try to run SP, they probably will go to their junkyard to get you a tool called SP. Nobody uses SP, okay? Now we are in an era that has high tech the minimum technology for clay and sand definitions is the gamma ray okay gamma ray if you need to go a little bit higher we'll go for a spectral gamma ray okay nobody uses sp sp has its own uh, difficulties as well it requires certain type of mods for certain type of salinity of the mud there were so many things okay so nobody's using sp believe me or not you will not probably in any new wells you will never hear the word sp you will see SP in old wells, okay? And believe me or not, if you go to Schlumberger, Harder, Burton Baker, and ask for SP, they will go to their junkyard to pick you one. There is nothing called it. Nobody produces SP tools anymore, okay? Spontaneous potential is a very, very old tool. Nobody's using it. 
So the, the correlation goes for the gamma ray correlation between sand, or I'm sorry, shale and non-shale. And the last example I showed you is what after we evaluated the lithology completely for the five wells, we started building correlations on lithology. So you can build correlation on gamma ray. You can build correlation on full lithology. You can build correlation on neutron density. You can build correlation on resistivity. Any law can be actually used to build your correlation based on your target of the correlation. What is the target of your correlation, okay? And the only condition, never, ever, ever, ever do it on measure depth. You have to do it on TVD, true vertical depth, okay? Okay, Dr. Mustafa, thank you very much. Uh, dear all, I'm just repeating myself, but I just to clarify to the participant that after each webinar, there is a quiz and a final exam at the end of the course. And to do them, you need to register in one Google Classroom only. And you can find all the relative information by following Arab Oil and Gas Facebook Academy Facebook page. Thank you, Dr. Arabi, and that's all for thank today. You. Wish you all a productive week. Bye-bye. Thank you.